welcome to another episode of Trinity Talk Live, water cooler conversation from a Christian perspective. I'm Ken Coughlin, and we have two familiar faces with us here today. I'm going to start seated to my left is Lori Hinman. Lori, you've seen before, she was earlier on our episode about the uh, mission work. Uh, Lori is currently the Bible Studies Coordinator here at Trinity. She also served for three years as the small groups leader, and she also leads the international mission trips here. She spent about four years leading the women's ministry and has been married for 30 years to her husband, Mike, and they have two boys. Welcome back, Lori. Thank you. And seated to my right is Ben Lander. Uh, Ben has been serving here at Trinity for about five years. He was initially the high school youth director, and he's now the lay minister. He's currently working on his Master's of Divinity, and he's married to his wife, Katie. They have two children. And... This is his third appearance. We actually let it, we, we get we actually managed to do three straight episodes without Ben on them, and that was just too darn much. So we had to bring him back. Welcome back, Ben. Thanks for having me again. again. So again and again and again. So I'm going to promise him, uh, just like last time, I promised him. No, we were going to give you some time off, and then we didn't. So um, all right. Well, why don't we go ahead and we're going to launch into our current events segment today. Uh, I got three stories today. The first one is from the Christian Post. The Christian Post is reporting that on July 6th, a judge in Iran sentenced four converts to Christianity to 10 years in prison. Uh, The charge was being Zionist Christians who acted against national security with the intention of overthrowing the state in a soft war, even though apparently there was no evidence that they'd actually done anything against national security. Uh, Two weeks earlier, the same judge had sentenced two other Christian converts to 10 years in prison each for propagating house churches, and they said that was uh, promoting Zionist Christianity. Uh, Second story, in 2018, actor Dennis Quaid will be starring in the upcoming film I Can Only Imagine, which is based on the popular Christian song of the same name by the group Mercy Me. Uh, It's going to tell the true life story of the upbringing of Bart I, I never, is it Millard? Millard? Millard. Millard, thank you. Bart oh. Millard, who's the lead singer. <laughs> Just roll with it. Uh, he's the lead singer of Mercy Me. I, I could pick him out of a crowd. I know what he looks like. Uh, anyway, he's going to tell his story. Um, now, when asked to describe the film, uh, Dennis Quaid said it's very uplifting about how one can really have a complete change in one's heart and how much you can move the earth with that. Uh, Millard said of the film, it's all about the redemption quality of the whole thing. It's the fact that if the gospel can change that dude, I'm assuming meaning himself, uh, it can change anybody. Uh, The film will also feature country star Trace Atkins and Cloris Leachman. Uh, Finally today, evangelist Ray Comfort, uh, the founder of Living Waters Ministries and the former host of the program The Way of the Master with Kirk Cameron, uh, he's released a new film titled Exit, which is targeting people who are contemplating suicide in an effort to try to give them hope. Uh, According to the World Health Organization, 800,000 people take their lives every year. That works out to about one suicide every 40 seconds or 2,000 lives lost every day. The film is hoping to point those who are suffering from deep sadness toward a, quote, better way. Uh, The the ministry here has got four main points. It's asking people to remember four things. Number one, you have worth. Number two, you you are loved. Number three, there is hope, and number four, help is available. And it's my understanding the film is going to flesh those out. Um, so let me start with Ben here and ask you, what of those four, uh, three stories stood out to you? Uh, yeah, I would say the first one with the, the whole uh, four Christians being thrown into prison uh, for propagating Zionist Christianity. I think uh, that term is, is kind of used, and um, I mean, I had to look it up to really see what exactly uh, they were talking about there. But it really is, it's common in Protestant belief, it's really since the Reformation been common with uh, really support of uh, Jews return to Israel. Um, that's you know, kind of Zionist Christianity, we, we support the Jewish occupation of Israel. And I can see how, just with the whole quagmire in the Middle East that it is, uh, how that can be, become political, uh, especially when you look at Jerusalem and the whole divide with the... Um, uh, the Jews and the Palestinians, and that everything that's going on there. Um, so I don't know if there's any like quick, easy answer to all of that. Like I said, it's just this mess, really. But um, but what we can do, certainly, we we pray for our brothers and sisters uh, overseas and throughout the world. And you know, it's interesting in situations like this, um, we see house churches popping up left and right in the Middle East. We see it uh, in China. We see all of these places where they're where Christianity is trying to be. 
uh, silenced and stomped out when really it's growing the most and we here in comfortable America sit in our uh, really contentment or our uh, apathy even. And I think it's really a call for us to, to be in prayer and to be supporting our brothers and sisters um, throughout the world. You know, it's funny you should mention that because it's the perfect way to toss it over to Lori because when Lori was on her last episode about mission work, uh, she made the exact same point that you just did, <laughs> actually, <laughs> about, about the, uh, the fact that the church seems to grow under times of persecution. Mm -hmm. um, so, Lori, what's it out to you? Uh, the third one, the, um, the movie on suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for the reason that uh, suicide was in the news really this week because of the suicide of uh, Chester Bennington, the uh, front man for the band Lincoln Park. And um, I think any time a, uh, a celebrity or someone who's well known commits suicide, it, it brings the issue back to the forefront. And it, it really shouldn't ever be out of the forefront. It shouldn't be, ever be something that we push away. But that statistic that you had of 2,000 lives lost every day, that's, that's sad. I mean, it's just sad. But, um, so it can't be something we sweep under the rug. It's a major issue. And um, I hope that those four points that they have, you know, you have worth, you are loved, there's hope and help is available. I do hope that that movie really um, brings that forth. And like really people get that that's the message because um, there's so many people that need to hear there's always help available somewhere. You know, there's always help available and there is always help, hope. So. Again, I hope it's successful in what that ministry is trying to do. Yeah, it, it seems to, like you said, at the point, the four points really seem to be important, and I'd mm -hmm. really like that message to get out there. I just hope that it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's going to be our current event segment. We're going to move on here. All right, so before we move into our topic of the week, um, I did want to address something I meant to address at the beginning. If you didn't notice, the set's a little bit different. Um, this, I don't know if it's going to be a permanent change or not. Um, we'll have to see. We had to move locations today, so in case things look a little bit different, that's why. But uh, I'm going to thank uh, my guest and my lovely wife who's behind the camera for helping scramble to find a solution here <laughs> to, to, to what we could do. So um, that, that's why we just had to move, move locations, and it, it caused a few technical issues that we had to work out. So, um, so today we are uh, going to be discussing a topic, are we seeing a diluted faith in modern Christianity? And I want to start out with, uh, well, more statistics, because I'm going to be known as Captain Statistics by the time <laughs> anybody who watches these shows regularly. Um, but uh, I, I want to start with a very recent study. This was from the Barna Group. Uh, this year, 2017, and they conducted a study among practicing Christians in America to, get, to, to gauge how much the uh, beliefs of other worldviews were seeping into Christians um, and how much they've influenced Christians' beliefs about how the world is, how the world should be, things like that. And they actually found a what might be described as a startling or staggering amount of seepage, so to speak, of other worldviews kind of being amalgamated into Christianity. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, they found 61% of the people they surveyed agreed with at least some ideas that were really more rooted in the new spirituality, new ageism. 54% um, had some type of postmodernist views, the idea that there's like no such thing as absolute truth, things like that. Um, you especially see that nowadays with morality, I think. 36% um, accepted some ideas that were associated with traditionally with Marxism, and 29% had some ideas that were based on secularism. Um, for um, to just give you a couple of examples, um, about 10% of practicing Christians said they believed the secular view that a belief has to be has to be proven by science to know that it's true. And as, a, as an apologist, that's actually something I come across quite a bit, and it's, it's actually one of the easiest things to disprove. All you've got to ask, your, ask somebody is, well, can that statement itself be proven by science? Because it can't, you know? It's just something you're taking on faith, and so you're violating the own rule even by stating the rule. Um, but that's something that 10 percent of Christians believe in that. Demographically speaking, men, often at a two-to-one ratio, were more open to these beliefs uh, seeping in and, and kind of combining them with their Christian faith than, than women were. Uh, and most importantly, if you look at it by generation, all right, millennials and Generation Xers um, were more than eight times as likely to embrace non-Christian worldviews as people from like the baby boomer generation or the elder generation. And so we are seeing something as we work our way through more recent generations that people are becoming more tolerant of or more accepting of other worldviews and kind of combining them with Christian worldviews. So uh, 
that's, that's the stage that I'm going to set right now, and I'm going to pass things off to you guys to figure out what the heck is going on here. So, Lori, let's start with you. What's going on here? Goodness. Um, well, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I'm going to uh, quote, actually, the guy that writes the book that you're teaching, um, Greg Kukul, and he has a great quote about, um, about Christianity. He says, only one in five Christians in the American church today has a biblical worldview, according to the Barnett Group. An example of this, uh, he says, is the Christian's inability to answer the two toughest challenges of life, the problem of evil and why Jesus is the only way. And um, I, I agree with you that um, the one sentence that you said about it had to be proven by science, um, to me is like the easiest thing to, to, to question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and mainly because, you know, science is about um, redoing what's what's happened and figuring out why it happened well you can't redo creation and you can't redo a miracle yeah. and you can't redo yeah, certain things we're talking so about here aren't subject to scientific yeah, they're not, testing you right know. you know certain things can but um so i think that uh there's definitely a lack of biblical knowledge which especially for the younger generations will be hard to make up and um I think the baby boomers, um, I'm right at the end of that. So I think what happens like in, in our lives was that we grew up in that 80s, 70s, 80s materialism kind of um, environment where the economy was just good, 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 and then all of a sudden it's not. And then so the baby boomers have sort of learned that, oh, there's nothing to this materialism. And so I think you're seeing baby boomers coming back to religion being um, a source of comfort. And, um, you know, maybe the next generation hasn't learned that yet. Thank well, Ben, what do you think's going on here? And yeah, you could fix it for us in 30 seconds or less, please. <laughs> Go ahead. <Yeah. laughs> no, I think um, I, agree, I agree with all those statistics. And I definitely see, you know, being of the millennial generation, I see, um, yeah, all of that seepage, if we want to use that word, into our thought, and I think it's because we've not instilled a, a um, firm enough foundation of biblical truth. You know, uh, just the statistics we're talking about where people aren't reading their Bibles uh, throughout the week. It's, you know, biblical illiteracy, and I think we'll get to that. It really has a lot to do with it, and, um, you know, all the different postmodernist views, and I think we tend to put more stock in, in science, in replicating mm -hmm. um, scientific fact. And, and we put, that takes just as much faith. Um, that's kind of what we don't realize because, you know, some experiments are replicatable. Uh, there's still fundamentally a step of faith that you have to take, mm -hmm. you know, um, with certain theories, uh, the Big Bang, um, evolution. You, there's still a step of faith that you have to take, even if it's just faith in the scientific process, mm -hmm. you know. so. Uh, we're not, we, we tend to question all of um, scripture. We tend to like scrutinize that and pick it apart, and, or at least culture does. And um, it's fine, you know, scripture holds up to that really well. <laughs> right. uh, but we don't do the same with science. You know, we kind of just, oh, these scientists have come out with this new study, and hey, let's, I'm not going to look into that. I just believe it because they're scientists. Hey, they got a lab coat on. I'm going to believe them. <laughs> and um, with, our genera with my generation in, in Specifically, um, you know, we've been brought up in this uh, pluralistic society where it's just, um, you know, postmodernism has been very um, pushed on us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually a quote from uh, one of my professors in my undergrad, uh, Duffy Robbins, uh, which I love. I use it every chance I get. But in, in response to the postmodern post belief that there's no such thing as moral right and wrong, mm -hmm says, if anybody ever tells you that there's no such thing as right or wrong, steal their iPad. You know, they'll tell you real quick that that is wrong. And so that's kind of you and me. When I was teaching the same thing in class last week. I said, punch him in the face. But, you know, that's <laughs> same, same principle. And then Amelia said, no, don't really do that. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't really do that. But um, yeah, we, we have to provide the same courtesy to, um, if we're going to be examining religion, we've got to examine all of our beliefs. And right. science you know, is a belief at some level. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, not, people not applying the same degree of maybe skepticism or, or uh, I don't know, examination for the scientific beliefs. I actually did a, um, a, a video blog on my, my personal YouTube channel um, 
uh, earlier this year, I think it was called like God the Master Builder 2, part two. It was, uh, I did a Master Builder part one, then I did a part two. And one of the things I mentioned in there was, uh, you know, imagine if I were to tell you that I have, you know, I had a little Lego airplane that my son had put together. And I said, imagine if I told you that I just took a bunch of Legos, threw them in a big old jug, shook it up, <laughs> And then out and pulled it out, and it was a fully assembled airplane. Would you believe me if I told you that's how I actually built it? No, you wouldn't believe me because the chances of that happening are just so remote. It's not that it's theoretically impossible, like it's theoretically possible, but so astoundingly unlikely that you're not going to believe that. You're going to approach that at least as, from a starting point of extreme skepticism. And yet, when you look at the way the universe has come together and the laws and the constants of the universe and how precisely tuned they are, it's astronomically more unlikely that that kind of precision would come about without intelligence, mm -hmm. and yet people don't approach it with the same starting point of skepticism that they would with my Lego example. So Very I just true. found that interesting. Mm -hmm. And also something you said, Lori, about, um, uh, about science as well, it, it made me think of a, uh, a book that Stephen Hawking came out with recently, about there's some being some things that can't necessarily be tested that science isn't appropriate for. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, the name of the book is now escaping me, and I'm gonna kick myself later, but uh, he, he started out in his opening chapter by saying, you know, philosophy is dead. Um, and basically saying philosophy has tried to answer all of these questions, you know, a lot of these origin questions and everything for a long mm -hmm. time, and it's failed and it hasn't succeeded. Science, however, can now succeed, and science will take the place of mm -hmm. philosophy. You don't need philosophy anymore. But then the funny thing was, is he didn't realize that then for the next, you know, first third of the book, he went about and was talking all philosophy. It was philosophy of science. Because the nature of the questions right. needed that kind of answer. You know, you couldn't examine it that way, and he just didn't realize it, so it was funny. <laughs> um, so moving on to something that Bill and something that, that Ben mentioned a second ago, he mentioned biblical illiteracy. Um, and I think you're right. There was a 2014 study by the Barna Group and the American Bible Society that actually said 81% of United States adults claim that they are either highly, moderately, or at least somewhat knowledgeable about the Bible. So everybody th people think they know something about the Bible, um, and yet less than half, only 43%, were actually able to name even the first five books of the Bible. Um, and that, that same study said that even though most people own a Bible, I mean, it's the best-selling book of all time, just a little over a third, 37% of Americans actually read it once a week or more. And I, we kind of said before we went on the air here, I was kind of questioning, I wonder how many of those 37% are counting the time they're sitting in the pew and somebody's reading it to them, they're just following along, you know, while the scripture's going on on Sunday mornings. Um, but in, in just about over a quarter of Americans, 26%, never read the Bible at all. So, I mean, that alone doesn't make sense. If 81% claim that they're at least somewhat knowledgeable about it, and yet 26% never read it, right. I mean, I'm not a math whiz, <laughs> but I can see there's a problem sort of there, because you've got at least some people that never read it, but claim they know it. <laughs> so, well, what do you think, Laura, is, is biblical literacy in any way contributing to the issue we're having with uh, the diluted faith we're seeing in modern Christianity? Well, sure, because if you don't know what's in the Bible, you can't say that I, um, I don't agree with it. So in other words, you know, if, if my kids, you know, yet they do, yes. <laughs> you know, if my kids don't know what's in the Bible and some college professor says something to them, they can't refute it because they don't know it. And it's just so important that um, we, can, we can say why we believe. And it's just, especially in this time of social media, um, just blowing, stories out of out of proportion and just having that solid foundation of why why do we believe what we believe and look we have absolute firm reasons for it mm -hmm. and here they are and um, I think it's just it's a shame that so many people don't open their Bible um, and so many people don't know what's in there the, the whole story of it so yeah, when I, when I started teaching the tactics course that you mentioned earlier, uh, in the first session, we, we, started, we looked at some scriptures, and mm -hmm. I was showing the class how Paul, how Apollos, how mm -hmm. all these other uh, uh, early Christians were not afraid to get up there and get into, right. I don't want to say spirit, I mean, not like hostile discussions, but yeah. what might be captured, captured today as like friendly debate or whatever, mm -hmm. about their Christian belief, because they weren't worried about it being right. examined, because they knew it stood up to right. examination. Um, so... Ben, let me ask you this. Why do you think people aren't reading their Bibles? 
I think it goes back to just the maybe shift in values of uh, our culture, our society, um, because of the pluralism in our, specifically I'm talking American uh, modern mm -hmm. culture. We have all of these, all this instant access to information. We have all these different views that are competing for that space in our mind and you know people only have so much to, <laughs> to really uh, put in there but um, yeah I think that, that um, we don't hold uh, Christianity or, or even any kind of religious belief to the standard that it, it used to be and uh, I think there's what I would call I don't know if I've mentioned this before but it's uh, the decentralization of religion where People aren't really coming to church anymore because they think they can get it elsewhere. They mm -hmm. think, um, you know, which is great. We've got shows like this. We've got um, uh, evangelists on TV and the radio. And yeah, you got to mm -hmm. sift that, take the good in with the bad. But, you know, there's something about coming together as a group of believers, a fellowship of believers, a body of believers. We're the body of Christ. And yet if we isolate ourselves from that and we think, oh, well, I can experience God on my own time, on my own terms that gets away from what the early church certainly was mm -hmm. and gets away from, I think, the values. Because, um, you know, scripture is clear, you know, as iron sharpens iron, we need that fellowship with, with other believers to really keep us accountable, keep us attuned to, um, you know, to, to be able to determine what it is we believe and uh, how we can then share that in the world. And, um, you know, you know, I, I think I've shared this before, but uh, a lot of specifically younger generations uh, will use the phrase, well, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it goes back to this whole uh, new age or, or spiritism or, or any kind of the... We tend to think that anything can be divine, you know, we, we, and so we glorify and kind of idolize these things that take the place of God in our hearts because everybody is created to worship something if you're not worshiping god you're worshiping something even mm -hmm. if that's yourself right. you know every human being has this altar in our hearts and you know a good way to examine that is if you were to take away what's the one thing that if you lost in your life you'd be devastated without and if it's anything other than god then you know there's a good chance that that's an idol and so um you know science can be an idol uh any like and you know we're just using that for for terms of uh, debate right now, <laughs> but uh, it could be anything, you know, even ourselves, our, our families, our possessions, um, sure. our comfortable society. Yeah, no, there's, there's, I want to make sure we're clear here. There's nothing wrong with science. Science is great. Right. As a matter of fact, if you look sure. historically, yeah. the, the modern scientific era was actually kind of ushered in by sure. Christians mm -hmm. um, and wanting to learn more about right. God's creation. So there's nothing inconsistent with, with Christianity and science. It's just a matter right. of acknowledging what the limits of science are. Right. And there's nothing wrong with science. I think where you get into a problem is where you have what's called scientism, where, like you're saying, mm. it can become an idol. Mm. Um, when you have somebody that comes up to you and says, well, I'm not going to believe anything that can be, unless it can be proven by science, without realizing that that statement itself can't be proven by right. science. <laughs> and so you're violating that. I think shows kind of what you're saying is that, okay, well, maybe that's the one thing that you're elevating um, and that you're worshiping. Yeah. You know, if it's gotten to the point where you, you hold it that, 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 uh, that dearly, so to speak. I have, um, can I yeah, add go a ahead. quote? Um, I just, I found this great quote, uh, just it ties right in with what Ben is saying, and it's from a, uh, a publisher at Zondervan. And um, he says, most would agree that the lack of Bible engagement is directly linked to anemic Christian faith. If indeed the scriptures are God-breathed, when you take away the breath, you're left with what humans can produce, better marketing, impressive architecture, and oratorical skills. So I was like, and that really is it. That people are not considering the Bible um, as God's word. Mm -hmm. So they take that out of the equation, and then you're just left with a book, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it's like a quote I found from uh, Kenneth Birding. He's a professor at Biola's uh, Talbot School of Theology. And he said, many Americans don't consider the Bible to be authoritative. Mm -hmm. That is, they don't consider the Bible to place a claim on their lives. They may consider the Bible to be important in a general sort of way, but this is a far cry from believing that God has communicated his will through this book, and therefore it is binding upon your actions. Mm -hmm. That didn't used to be the case. So let me ask you this, Lori, um, 
this is the part where I'm just going to back off and let you guys, you know, <laughs> sink or swim. Uh, what do we do about it? I mean, you're, you're look, talking about people that are being bombarded by cultural messages and competing pluralistic views. And, you know, far, obviously people are out in the world far more than they're sitting here in, in our church. So our influence compared to, as far as to your hours, mm -hmm. is obviously limited compared to what they're getting uh, from outside in the world. But So how do you compete with that? Uh, you compete with that by aggressively trying to recruit people to get into groups and study the word. And you just, I mean, like, you know, the young adult group here, I mean, they want to study the word. They want answers. They want to be able to refute their professors if they're saying something that, that's not true. And um, they, I see in the, in the younger, younger generations that right after high school generation, I just see a hunger. They want something deeper. They really want to dig deep. And I think if we just were to recognize that and not dismiss that whole generation as millennialists and we're going to throw them out because they don't, you know, Sorry, they don't think the out. same way <laughs> that we do. And, you know, but I think if you just take a step back and know where they're coming from, um, but give them, they need information and we just have to give them the right, in the right way. Um, and we have to do it maybe a little differently than we did in the past, but you know, through videos and things like that. But it's definitely necessary <clears throat> to get them educated so that they can defend their faith. As a matter of fact, I strongly encourage uh, the, the revolution group. There's a p p part of what uh, Greg Kokel talks about in his book, Tactics. Um, he does talk about something called the professor's ploy. Mm -hmm. And while it does have a broader application, it does specifically deal with how to handle that type of situation where you're the student right. and you're sitting in a classroom and a professor says something challenging to Christianity, such as some that I've known that right. have come in and said, well, if you're a Christian now, you won't be by the end of the class. So, men, let me ask you, what do we do about it? How do we compete with the compete, these messages that people are being bombarded with that are telling them it's okay to combine this with, with your Christian faith? I think Lori's right. The more that we can educate, uh, the more people have a foundation of knowing what they believe to begin with. But I think another thing that we maybe sometimes uh, forget about is that it can't all just be head knowledge. It's got to be a transformation of the heart. That's the whole point of the gospel. You know, and Jesus even says in Matthew 24, 12, actually, this is not really a surprise for those who are in the word because throughout scripture, it tells us that apostasy will increase and we're seeing that. And Jesus, like I said, in Matthew 24, 12 says, because lawlessness will increase, most people's love will grow cold. So we've got this head knowledge and people are elevating all these things. We're, we're, we're trying to elevate humans, humankind, like, look, how knowledgeable we are, look how smart we've become, look how much we can do on our own, we don't need God. And, you know, like I said, we're all created with that hunger and desire, and we see that people are hungry for answers, they're hungry for something to be passionate about. And if it's not God, then it's going to be something that will ultimately fail them. Because God is the only thing that we can really have a firm foundation in. And so how do we deal with that is... Uh, another thing that I would add, you know, when we encounter a culture, there's really three responses that we can have to it. We can reject it. We can say, well, that's culture. It's all bad. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I'm going to go live and be a hermit and be a monk or whatever, ascetic. Um, we can receive it, um, just all of it, and say, you yeah, have no discretion whatsoever. And so we kind of really water down our faith where you get all of these competing worldviews where it doesn't even resemble Christianity anymore. Um, or the third option is to redeem it. Um, you know, you sift in the good with the bad, and you, you figure out, well, what, what can I take out of this? And what does God's word say about this? And, you know, we're going to hold true to God's word, and we're going to hold that up and draw a firm line in the sand. But, I mean, what, what, can, what does culture have to offer, too? You know, when um, a lot of people, you know, just looking at movies or, or media in general, well, people will say, well, what's bad with this movie? What's wrong with it? And I think that's the wrong question to ask. We're not asking ourselves, as Christians, we shouldn't be asking ourselves, well, what's wrong with doing this? We should ask what's right with doing it. You know, if this is not elevating, if it's not edifying, um, you know, when Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is right, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we can, you know, culture has some things to offer that we can redeem in that way, um, but I think we just got to be very vigilant and, and careful about that. 
Yeah. I think that's a good point. Well, I hate to cut us off because this is one of those topics that I think we could go on for like hours. And uh, but you know, I, people might start you know turning off the uh, <laughs> the, 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 the channel from by then. So um, we're going to cut it off here right now. But I'm going to thank you very much for joining me again, both of you again, uh, multiple <laughs> guests. So I think this was really really good. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you did like this video, do me a favor. You could please go ahead and click the like button, the thumbs up button here on the YouTube channel. That does help it get viewed by more and more people. Also, please feel free to share it with your friends. Tell your friends about it. Put it on social media, whatever. Especially a topic like this, I think is really, really important to get out there. Uh, and so you can help us do that by telling other people about it. Um, we're going to be back um, next Tuesday at noon. We got a special episode lined up there about uh, balancing uh, your work and your family. Um, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. That helps you stay up to date on everything we've got going on. Explore it. There's a lot more on the uh, Trinity Joppa YouTube channel other than just Trinity Talk Live. Um, also, something new, that I, I mentioned this last week, I want to mention again now, Trinity Talk Live does now have its own Facebook page. We still have the, the church itself has a Facebook page, but Trinity Talk Live has one as well. If you could go ahead, find us on Facebook. It is um, at Trinity Talk Live Podcast. Uh, and on there, we're going to obviously put more things about what we've got coming up, what we've got in the works. Also, more than anything, we want to use that for so that you can post on it or you can comment. You can ask us questions. If there's something we mention in uh, one of these episodes, I always put a post up there about the actual episode. You can comment on that. If any particular questions you have, we'd be happy to try to answer them. If you have ideas for new podcasts, topics that you would like to see covered, please use that to let us know so we can try to work that into the schedule. Um, thank you very much again. I'm going to thank you again, Lori Hinman, for coming back. Lori's already booked again. I'm not going to say when. We're going to surprise you all, but she's coming back. Um, ben, i got to talk to you afterwards. Uh, so, all right. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for joining us again this week. God bless. In your word we will find.